Today we're going to clean up our act by learning how to get a little bit more dirty. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's video. So painting cleanly can be very scary as a thing to even want to attempt because at a conceptual level we associate it with lots of very precise strokes. It can be all too easy to assume that these techniques are out of reach or not even worth trying. However, it's not, it's not just to do with how you use your brush. It's about how well the sculpt reads to the eye and what your painting can do to improve that. So I want to take you through some ideas that can assist with helping a sculpt to read well without forcing you as the painter to have to work too hard. I'll be demonstrating this using a towel, ghost key or battle suit, which I'm currently working on as a like a test scheme for all of the kind of mechanized battle suit parts of of my towel studio army. I feel like this is a really good way to demonstrate these ideas because the towel are kind of the epitome of what we consider to be a very clean army from a visual perspective. So let's go into that. A lot of the time when a sculpt has a lot of clean lines and open panels, it's really easy to be scared to mess up those hard lines in between them, the points of transition. So you can see here that I have spots of black dotting onto areas that I kind of want to be white so that they look nice and clean. When you come in to correct the white, what you can do to help with this is just keep the brush at a very acute, very flat angle. Now, what this is going to do is allow the bristles to glide over the sunken area, passing it, and we, get, we can keep that area full of black paint, but we still get a clean, crispy white edge on top of it. If you're lucky enough to own an airbrush, it's very easy to apply a bottom-up shadow to sort of wide open areas and that's going to be great for kind of drawing the attention of the viewer to the much brighter top surface and kind of keeping it away from that shaded lower surface. When we look at a large crisp shape typically our eyes drawn to the brighter part first. So that gives you sort of overall less area on the miniature where you have to be on top form. It gives you a bit more room to kind of just do your best painting in the smaller areas and that mitigates the chances of maybe a slip up being so obvious. It also happens to look really cool just with that sort of undershaded appearance. If you don't own an airbrush, it's still fairly easy to achieve, just a lot slower. What you're gonna to have to do is sort of patiently do large sweeping glazes of a shadow color towards the lower portions of the shapes, going downwards and downwards so that at the very bottom of the shape it's darkest and where it transitions that glaze is sort of at its thinnest. So it's gonna take a lot longer, but you will get a similar effect. Now I know the concept of using oil paints on minis is really, really weird for a lot of people. But the truth is that when it comes to something like panel lining, they just are strictly better than acrylics. And I don't use that phrase lightly. Not only are they a crevasse-seeking missile, hunting down any and all channels and kind of moving into them with ease without even you asking them to. They will, they will want to seek out channels. But once you give them sort of a blast of a hairdryer, get them touch dry, then you can just go in with a brush that's been dampened very, very slightly with some white spirit and use that to re-clean the surface areas. Not only is that a lot, it's a lot less skill intensive and I really can't stress that enough. It's so much easier, but it's also a lot faster. You know, if you, if you imagine when you when you do this process with the traditional acrylic way, you have to sort of manually paint into all of those little cracks and crevasses, and then you have to repaint all of those surface areas for the parts where you'll inevitably make a mistake. That can be especially stressful if there's a gradient on those areas, but as you can see in my example, there's a gradient in my panel lined areas, that sort of gray to white gradient that I put in with the airbrush earlier, and it's still just as easy to just swipe that off with some white spirit, get it clean, get it looking great again. Now perimeter weathering is a weird effect. Every time I describe it, it sort of sounds like it couldn't possibly look good, which is, not the best sell. I mean, watch this. I will describe it for you and you tell me. So essentially, you just draw a dark dotted line around the internal perimeter of a shape, avoiding all of its hard edges. 
it sounds silly, but the effect that it gives, it doesn't just create like a, an area of visual interest. It sort of invites, you know, the viewer to explore your work. But what it also does is it, it kind of artificially replaces edge highlights, which is very clever because it, it leaves a dark color right beside all of those edges that you would normally edge highlight because you're sort of moving on to the very edge of the flat panel before it hits the edge highlight. And so what that does is sort of draws people's attention to those peak edges, those corners, those apexes, those, those areas that you would highlight without you actually needing to highlight them, which is kind of magic. <laughs> Introducing bright, attention-grabbing colours onto simple shapes of the miniature is a really great way to give yourself just some low-stress, easy visual interest. You just want to pick shapes on the sculpt that you're confident that, you know, because you can reach them and because they're fairly simple, that you can execute them nice and cleanly. You know, things like knee pads on a space marine or elbow pads on a space marine, or, you know, in this case, all of the little gyros and orbs on these towel miniatures. And then you fill them in just nice and cleanly and accurately. And I know, obviously, we're trying to avoid too much clean, accurate painting, but that's why we're choosing shapes that we feel simple and comfortable with. And uh, we just pick a colour that sort of really stands out, you know, maybe sort of a highly contrasting colour, like a complementary or something. Um, or, you know, in this case, I've gone for a metallic because everything else is very sort of flat. Textural highlighting is essentially it's just the process of using jaggedy, picky little strokes to build up deliberately rough gradients of colour. Starting with a dark area of colour and covering sort of quite a large amount of the shape that you want to highlight, you just gradually decrease the size of the highlight whilst increasing the brightness, but stick into those kind of jaggedy, stabby, dotting kind of strokes that are very easy to perform. Eventually, when you get to the brightest part of the highlight, you'll find yourself just kind of dabbing the edges of each shape with the tip of the brush. And it's very simple to do. It's very easy because it rewards shakiness and impreciseness. It's worth noting that this technique, it does kind of make the most sense if you apply it as a directional highlight. So we're trying to kind of avoid that hyper skill intensive edge highlight in any way while still making something beautiful. So if you just kind of pick a direction that you want the light to be coming from and you try to imagine how the light's going to hit the surfaces on the miniature. Now I know that's difficult, but probably the simplest way to look at this is if you just go with like a top down directional lighting because basically all you need to do there is say, the more this shape is facing upwards, the more highlight it gets, the less it's facing upwards, the less highlight it gets. And that's a pretty simple concept to be able to get your head around. Of course, you can choose to break that rule every now and again if you just want to sort of draw attention to a certain area on the miniature, or if you just think that it looks cooler to have the highlights a bit brighter there. Rule of call always wins. And that really is all there is to it. Six simple steps that you can use to attack those clean miniatures without stressing yourself over getting that sort of super clean style of painting down. Let's take a look at how our ghost kill looks in its completeness now. Let's see what the culmination of all of this is with these techniques applied to the entire miniature. You can see that overall we've made a really striking piece. The light indifference provided by that undershade means that we can focus our best painting, as I said before, onto the tops of each area. And those little sort of tricks and cheeky little tips that we've gone over are all utilized just to minimize stress, maximize effect. I'd really love to know what you think of this method, so please do get at me in the comments below. enjoyed this slightly different approach to painting and as you'll have probably noticed a slightly different approach to uh, actually making a video as well I don't normally do them like this please don't forget to uh, click like if you liked the video hit the subscribe button if you want to see more and of course if you like what I'm doing here and you want to support me through patreon there is a link to my patreon campaign in the uh, description of the video as well I've got tiers starting from as little as a dollar a month that you can support as well and all of them include benefits some of those benefits are absolutely fantastic 
fantastic. You'll also find links to all of my socials in the description so you'll be able to join me on social media to chat when I'm not here making videos. So everybody, thanks for watching very much and I'll see you in the next one.